Good afternoon, folks. My name is Michael Ayers, and I'm Dean for Math, Science, and Technologies here at Forsyth Tech. And I would like to welcome you all to our SciTech lecture series. This has been a really wonderful event for our institution. It's, it's a few years old now, and to date we've had almost 20 very dynamic presenters for talking about all sorts of, of subjects related to math, science, and, and technologies. The series is made in cooperation with the National Center for the Bio Network and from uh, Forsyth Tech's Math, Science, and Technologies Division. Roughly over 1,750 folks have attended these sessions over the years. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Michael Myers, who has a very similar name to mine. Uh, he is the current chair of SciWorks, and he will introduce our speaker today, Dr. Paul Cortnar. Thank you for having me here, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially for the reason why I am here. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had had 20 outstanding speakers. Well, you're about to have 21. It's not me. I'm not one of those. Um, so Paul is definitely a person that we are very excited and very proud to have at SciWorks. Um, I'll just tell you a quick little story about how I came to know Paul. It's probably about 19 months ago, and... I was asked to become the chairman of the board probably a year before that um, at SciWorks. And so at the time, we had a different executive director. And like, nah, you'll, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be fine. The, uh, the workload is not as bad as being in development for SciWorks. You won't know, have that much work to do. Well, then four months later, I found out our former executive director was retiring and that we'd be starting an executive director search. And so obviously, the workload got a lot thicker and a lot heavier at that point. Um, but we met Paul probably March or maybe April of last year, or year, actually two years ago. And uh, as part of our um, resume, part of our application process, and immediately when Paul came and interviewed actually via teleconference from Canada, I don't know if many of y'all know that, but, but Paul is a Canadian um, and had, it came down from Canada from the Toronto um, or the Ontario Science Center, but when Paul uh, uh, was on a um, teleconference from Canada, immediately when he hung up the teleconferencer and we got off offline, I looked at everybody and said, that's our guy right there, um, and everybody else agreed. We knew from the get-go that he's the kind of person that we wanted here at SciWorks and here at Winston-Salem to um, do the informal hands-on and be a part of the informal hands-on learning that is so crucial to science education. And so we, are, we were very excited when Paul accepted uh, our offer for the position. And every day um, seems like he's getting more and more comfortable and he's just done a wonderful job and we can't say enough about Paul. So uh, I'll go ahead and get off and introduce uh, and ask Paul to come up here, but uh, thank you all for having us. So hopefully you can all hear me easily. Uh, I tend to wander a bit, so you'll have to forgive me. And I also tend to speak very quickly because I'm Canadian. So um, my topic today is talking about technology in the classroom and how we introduce technologies in the classroom and how we uh, can introduce them successfully to get kids to be able to be comfortable with the technologies and to be ready for a changing world. And the interesting thing to me in that is that as an educator, I'm terrible with technology myself. So if the technology goes awry, please understand that this is me presenting and not my students who are infinitely better at using the technology than I ever was. So those of you who've heard me speak before hear me talk about this all the time, so I promise it will only be the beginning of my presentation and not the whole thing. There will be lots new as well. But it seems to me that what we have to do in education is get kids ready to be in a different kind of world than the one we have right now. One of the problems for those of us who are a little bit older who came up through the education system we had was that it prepared us perfectly for the world as it already existed. So we learned about things and we were prepared to take part in a society that already existed. And that society did not have the kinds of technologies that we're all uh, now becoming used to having. 
For those of you who are currently in school, and there's a lot of you, I don't know what the technology is going to look like 10 years from now. So there's no point in my preparing you to use all of today's technologies if those aren't the technologies that are around 10 years from now. So what I have to do instead, and what we all have to do as educators, is prepare you to be ready for anything that comes your way, for any new technology, for any new sort of iteration. And it's only when we do that that we're really going to be able to prepare you for the, for the different world we have. And what we need to really do is prepare you to be innovative. We need to provide you with the skills necessary to become innovative individuals and to be part of an innovative society. And so what we've done at SciWorks and previously at the Ontario Science Centre, we tried to figure out what those skills were that you would need to be innovative in the future. And the real challenge, and those of you who are educators will know this, the real challenge is to try to introduce those skills in a regular classroom. And how, do we, how do we do that? How do we assess them, et cetera? So I've listed those skills there. The first is creativity. We all have our sort of own definitions for what that is. But as you know, if we have a curriculum, and now we're heading toward the core curriculum, the common core, it's very difficult to allow for creativity when we have standardized curricula that we have to work through. Collaboration is impossible. You, those of you who've done it will know that the only time you're going to fail your SAT is if you ask your neighbor for help. And in the real world, when, you, when you're out working in a job like I am, the only time I fail is if I don't ask people who know far better than I do for help. And how do we build that skill? How do we build that idea that people have to collaborate into education so that people recognize that what they need to do is ask people and work together to solve problems. And, and to, to create a school system that does that is difficult. And what we're going to look at today is a way that technology can aid us in doing that. Risk taking, I think this is incredibly important and almost impossible. For those of you who are currently in classes, you'll recognize that your first question when a teacher says, hey, we've got this assignment, I want you to write an essay for English class. Your first question is always, how many pages? Exactly what do you want me to do? We're not going to take a risk. If the teacher asks for an essay and says it's 10 pages, we're not going to hand in a video because we're afraid that it's going to affect our grade. Right? We're not going to take that risk. So we have to create a system where risk taking is possible, where it's, it's OK to try something different. And of course, inherent in that, is we have to provide for the fact that if you take a risk, it might not work. And that shouldn't cause a detriment to your grade because you've tried something different and it didn't work out. And then, of course, we get that perseverance. The idea that when you try something and it doesn't work, you try it again. You work at it over and over until you can accomplish the goals. If we can present opportunities for every child to do this through their formal schooling, then we're going to be able to prepare the children, especially here in Winston-Salem, to be part of an innovative society. Now, the challenge is, how do we do that? And one of the ways we can do it is through technology. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, I have a little note at the bottom there, and I'll move the cursor, because I realize it's in the way. But um, I point out that these are the same skills required by entrepreneurs. And there's a little story I tell all the time. When I first got to Winston-Salem, I was staying at the Embassy Suites Hotel, and I was chatting with the bartender at the hotel downstairs. And he had a BBA, a Bachelor of Business Administration from Appalachian State University up in Boone, a university I had never heard of as a Canadian. And um, he was describing how great this was, the program he'd done. And what he said was he was very disappointed because he'd finished his degree. He'd done a four-year degree. And he finished his degree four years earlier. And now he was working as a bartender at the Embassy Suites Hotel. Because although he was sending out resumes all the time, nobody was offering him a job in his field, which was business. And so he wanted to know what he was doing wrong. And my response was, well, make an app for a phone. And he said, I don't know how. And I said, neither do I, though I will teach you by the end of this lecture how to do that. But I didn't know how. Uh, that had never stopped me as a teacher from telling my students to do it. 
So I'm going to tell you a story as we go along that I was teaching AP physics, and I would tell my students to make an app. And they would say, do you know how to make an app? And I would say, no, I don't have to learn that. You do. Right? That's part of your job, not mine. Okay? But so here I am. I said, go make an app. He says, I don't know how. I said, well, here's how you're going to do it, and I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes. And then he said something that absolutely floored me. And a number of my board members are here who run small businesses or even large businesses. And what he said to me was, and you'll find this shocking, was, well, what if it doesn't work? Well, it's that risk-taking thing. I was like, so make another one. You know, keep trying again until it works. Oh my, you know, that was, he expected it to succeed the first time because that's what our education has prepared us for. You know the results of the experiments you're going to do before you do them. Right? We expect it to work a particular way before we even do it. And we don't help kids to learn that, in fact, it's strange the first time if something works. It's going to fail several times, and you have to try again. And that's part of being an entrepreneur as well. You know, it's it it amazing. This is not the first of these lectures I attended. I came last time when Stephen Hill was here, and he's the president of Targacept. And he was talking about, in the biotechnology world, it's all about failure. We're going to fail over and over and over and over and over again. And we need investors who understand that it might take us years to reach a success. Well, we need children who understand that, that sometimes you have to try over and over again until you reach that success point. So how do I create a classroom that begins to allow students to experiment with the technologies and to, uh, to work in an innovative way? So, I, was, I have just completed my doctorate. I just defended in November. And in my dissertation, this is what we were trying to do, was give kids an opportunity to learn those skills of innovation and figure out a way to do that. And the first thing we established was the kind of classroom we created had to be different. Now, for the educators in the room, I'm not arguing you have to do this every day in every class, because it's not possible to meet a curriculum and do that. But I'm arguing that in every course we teach, we can create some experiences that are like this. So first of all, we have to make our classroom proscriptive rather than prescriptive. If you think of prescriptive, think of a prescription. Think of a recipe. It's the usual way we do a lab in the classroom. We tell students exactly step by step what they have to do. Now add 40 milliliters of uh, sodium hydroxide to this and watch for the titration and watch for the change of color, et cetera. That's prescriptive. And if we look at step by step, it's a recipe. It's safe, which is important in a lot of classrooms. And so that's why we follow prescriptions. It's also controlled. And this is a major issue, right? We want to make sure that we know what our students are doing all the time. And it's very simple. And it, students perceive it as simple. And that's a challenge. Whereas if we can create a proscriptive environment, and it, here I want you to think about a classroom differently. It's a classroom in which you set goals and boundaries. So you say, three weeks from now, this is where we need to be. Four weeks from now, four months from now, whatever. We need to have learned x. And you cannot do this. You cannot blow up my classroom. You cannot, you know, you have to set those boundaries. But within those boundaries, the students have freedom to be creative and to solve problems. That's a proscriptive environment. And a proscriptive environment allows for that kind of freedom. And as a teacher, it's incredibly hard to do. Because, as all teachers, I want to be the center of attention. I want to be the one you're looking at and listening to while I talk about Einstein's theory of relativity. Listen to me. Well, no. If we're going to learn, we have to step back and be quiet and so give the kids a chance to learn. And that's really hard as an educator to do, to create the right environment rather than being the talker all the time. He says while well, he talks for an hour. So it allows for creative, creativity. It allows for complexity. And complexity, complexity research and complexity science is one of these big topics at the moment. And this is what my dissertation was all about. How could we make 
groups of kids working together into complex groups. Complexity has specific definitions about how it works, and we're going to look at that in a minute. And it's as a teacher, how do you create complexity in the classroom so that students can actually work together and create something new? And that something new they create is knowledge. It is new knowledge that students create working together. And that's this emergence. You know, you cannot take an ant, and you, you know, like the insect, not the, not the relative. You can't take an ant, separate it out, and expect it to build a colony and an ant, you know, and to dig all the tunnels, etc. But an ant colony builds from an ant community all working together. But there is no one telling the ants what to do. That situation is complex, and the colony you build is emergent, we call that. We have to start creating those situations in our classrooms. So the first thing we have to recognize, and that we never recognize in the regular classroom, is that education and learning is socially situated. That means we learn together as a group. Whenever we create individualized tests that go up to somebody and say, what did you learn in this class? We're denying this thing that we actually know, that you are creating that knowledge, you're creating that learning together as a class. And we have to find ways to assess you as a class in what you've learned together. And if we assume that learning is socially situated, then a group of learners together can be complex if they meet these criteria. So there cannot be any hierarchy. You cannot tell one student they're in charge and they get to dictate to other students what they're going to do. Because otherwise, you have a teacher again. You've made it a student, but you've created that teacher. Instead, all the students in the group together have to be working together and equal. You cannot give them predefined roles. They'll work out those roles as they go. And they do. And the interesting thing is one day, one student's the recorder and, and takes down notes from a meeting. And the next day, that student is generating ideas. They're doing different things. But they're always working toward the same goals. The students have to have some similar background knowledge. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to work. If one student has far more knowledge than the others, then there you start creating these hierarchies again. So the specific case we were looking at was an AP physics class. And the specific project we were looking at was designing an exhibit for our science center. So groups of kids were asked to design exhibits for the science center we were working in. All of the students had passed grade 11 physics. So they'd all come for our AP program. It's a little bit different in Canada, but, but that's the system. So they had the similar background. They had a similar kind of physics knowledge before they came. That's very important. So there was no hierarchy control con by having different knowledge. But you still have to allow for stimulus and feedback. And that's where the technology comes in. My students were given by a cell phone company in Canada, every student in the class was given a smartphone. This is already two years ago, so they weren't very smart by today's standards, but they were smartphones with unlimited data. And the kids, we said as the five teachers in this school, because the school was very small and it was inside a science center, we said, you can use them all the time. You can bring them to class. You can use it all the time. We are never going to tell you to turn it off. And what we discovered was the students found their own ways to use it educationally. And we're going to talk about that. And I'm going to talk about why teachers don't like to do that kind of thing. Why, as the principal at the school, I was able to say, this is what you're going to do. And the other teachers went, I, we don't want to do that. And I was like, I don't care. You're going to let your students use their phone in class anytime they want to, any way that they want to. And that's very important because our students started to communicate all the time using their phones. And we're going to look at why that is in a moment. So the logic of the research I was doing and the logic of the project we set up was this. If I could create groups that would behave in a complex way, 
then I allowed for emergence. I allowed for the creation of new knowledge. That new knowledge that was created is itself complex. And so I need a way to map it, to follow how it's being done. And this uses a theory from Deloise and Guattari, who are two French philosophers, who think about how does knowledge look, how do structures work in the real world. The way we talk about knowledge now, we think of it as, uh, and I'm going to use a, a gardening term here, but I'm not in the least a gardener, as a sort of taproot, like a carrot. We think of knowledge as monolithic, as one thing we have to learn. And that's what we talk about when we build a curriculum, et cetera. You know, this is what our students are going to know by the end of this semester or this year. Knowledge isn't like that. Deloise and Guattari, they argue that knowledge is rhizomatic. If you imagine you know, the, the roots further away from the carrot, all, the, all intertwined and mixed up. That's what knowledge is like. And you have to allow people to create their own. And the job as a teacher is then to figure out a way to map that, to figure out what your students are doing while they use these technologies, et cetera. So what we did was, and we didn't know we were going to do this. I had no idea how I was going to map this new knowledge students created. But we were actually able to follow it on Facebook. Our students were Facebooking, and I know lots of you have already outgrown Facebook. You're now using Secret, or you're using some other social networking site. But two years ago, for high school students, Facebook was it. And they set up Facebook groups in order to do the work for their projects. And they posted to these groups 24-7. And all that I did as the researcher was take every posting they made and determined who it was intended for and what it was about. And we were able to create, now these are very simple, these were the sort of opening lines. They, we were able to create very complex maps of how the students were working together and putting together knowledge. So suddenly the technology, that mobile phone they were using, allowed me to create a picture, create a map of all the times that my students were communicating with each other. Because even in class, they were sending texts and Facebook postings to each other. Now, my students did not want me reading all their Facebook posts that had to do with things other than this, logically. And so as the researcher, you have to get their permission first. And we got the permission to look only at those posts related to the work that they were doing in designing an exhibit for the Science Center. But it was really very stunning to start mapping this out. And if you notice, Michelle and all the names have been changed, not that you would know any of these kids anyway. But if you notice, Michelle actually made posts, and they're in red, meaning that they were negative comments, about herself on Facebook. She'd be like, oh, I, I, you know, I can't believe I didn't show up to that meeting. I forgot all about it. And suddenly, we could understand what was going on within a group. Far more than we could understand when we were trying to just listen to conversations. And of course, every time we tried to just listen to a conversation among the students when they were doing group work, they became incredibly self-conscious. There's nothing like putting a camera in to film somebody while they're talking to make them self-conscious about the way they're talking to everyone else in the group. Suddenly, they all want to appear brilliant. And so all the comments they make are far smarter. Whereas in Facebook, they're not worried about their spelling, et cetera. They're telling you the honest comments, especially because they weren't remembering all the time that we would see these later. So this kind of thing is very important. But it does pose a challenge to teachers. How do we assess this kind of knowledge they're learning if it's not strictly from the curriculum? My students designed an exhibit but there was no design and exhibit for a science center objective in the Ontario curriculum. So we had to find a way to slot what we wanted to do within the curriculum. Now I'm assuming it's the same here. There are not only knowledge objectives, but you also have skills the kids have to learn and attitudes they're supposed to develop towards STEM, towards these different things. 
So we slotted it within those. So how did this technology transform the classroom, and why am I always arguing in favor of the technology? I had a student named Kelton who was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. We're talking a perfect score in AP math, a perfect score in AP physics. We could not create a test on which he would make a mistake. And I was teaching the AP physics. And this kid would put up his hand and ask what I thought was a stupid question. He would put up his hand 15 times a day and say, where did you get that number from? And I would be like, you know. Like of all the kids in this class, you know where it came from. And what we discovered, and I didn't know this, and this wasn't part of my research. It's only something I discovered along the way. The other kids in the class, so there were you know, 24 kids in my AP science class, were too afraid to put up their hand and admit they didn't know something. But because everyone knew Kelton was brilliant, he had nothing to risk by putting up his hand and saying, I don't understand. So when we distributed these phones, the kids texted him their questions. Because he would ask, and they didn't have to. So because otherwise, you know, I'm such a regular teacher. I would stand in front of the room and say, does everyone understand that? And everyone would nod. And 20 of the 24 had no clue what I had talked about. And just by their nodding, I would think, oh, yeah, I've done my, uh, you know, I've done my formative assessment along the way. They're all nodding. That's a good thing. And no, they actually taught themselves to send text messages. I didn't tell them to do that. Right? They did it. That's the secret. You've got to give them that freedom to figure it out themselves. So hand them the technology. I wasn't even on Facebook at the time. I don't use Facebook now. But my students were on it. And then they taught me how to do this, right? So they were like, put a Twitter feed up on your, on your smart, we, we had a smart board at the front of the room. So my students were like, here's how you create frames on your smart board. And if you have an anonymous Twitter feed going up, then we can tweet our questions. We don't have to go through Kelton anymore. And you'll know right away when we have a question. I'm like, I have no idea how to do that. So some student walks up to the front, and five minutes later, it's working. The fact that I don't know how to do it doesn't matter. What matters is they know how to do it. And, and I, I was thinking of the smart board. I just thought this was incredible. You know, we, I thought I was so cool as a teacher, because I got smart boards in all of the classrooms in the school for which I was responsible. Wasn't I amazing? And of course, my teachers had no idea how to use these smart boards. And my kids, once they got their smartphones, never used the smart board. And I asked a kid, why not? And he's standing on his smartphone, facing the class, manipulating the mouse through Bluetooth on the screen behind him, and working away. And I said, why aren't you using the smart board? We paid, you know, however many thousand dollars for this smart board. Why aren't you using it? Here I am, the specialist in pedagogy. The, teacher, the kid says to me, the teacher, well, that would be stupid because I'd be facing away from the class. This way, I'm facing toward the class. Like, duh. Why don't I know that? You know, meanwhile, you know, and I'm supposed, I have my doctorate in education. And this 17-year-old kid is telling me how to teach, is teaching me how to teach using the technology. That's the situation we have to get to, right? But we don't because we're afraid to give kids that freedom to allow for that kind of experimentation. So building an application. If you want to do this yourself, and this is what I did in my physics class, and I'll show you one of the applications they made. So there's an MIT App Inventor. So we, we can put this slideshow up online after we're done, if you like. So you just Google MIT App Inventor. And it's like Lego robotics. It gives you all the pieces, and you put it together like Lego pieces, and you build an app that you download to your phone. You can make an app to do anything. You want to make a game like Angry Birds and make millions of dollars? Make an app. What's the problem? Here's how you do it. Uh, by the way, this is all in the Google world. This is not in the, in the, uh, in the iWorld, in the Apple world yet. So you know, 
this is the kind of thing you can just go and do and we can encourage kids to do. I still have never made my own app. I have no idea how to do it. It doesn't matter. I know that if I tell students about this, they can go do it, no problem. Now, we did have one thing in Canada that was different. Of course, we didn't have a technology divide. All of my students got a smartphone. And that is a challenge. You know, I can't guarantee that every kid will have a smartphone. But I can tell you that I was on a committee, and I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I will, will anyway. I was on a committee to look at technology in the new library in, here in Forsyth County. We're building a new central library here in Winston. And when I was asked what technology we should put in the new library, I said, don't build a new library. Provide everybody in Forsyth County with a tablet and wireless access. Don't use your $20 million to build a building. Give everybody access so that they can play with the technology. Now, we can't quite do that politically, but it is the right idea, and that's what we have to be working towards. So I, I won't actually click through, but the link is right there. So if you see my slideshow later and you're welcome to, then just click through to the link. In the Science Center, we created a YouTube video. So this is my students being my students. So they're wearing red lab coats because that's what our students wore. One of their challenges was to imagine how you could engage with the exhibits we already had in the Science Center in a new way using your technology. And those of you who know the system here, Atkins High School here in Winston-Salem is doing exactly the same for SciWorks right now. I'm not building new exhibits. I'm asking kids for ways to turn their smartphone into part of the exhibit. I don't want a talking head. I'm not interested in somebody explaining the science. I want you to put your smartphone on something spinning around and have your smartphone give you some information about it. Then you're, of course, taking a risk in that case by putting your smartphone on something, but OK. So what my students here, they were they're doing uh, physics. What did they do? Well, we had ramps. I'm assuming I have internet access, whoever my tech guru is. So we're waiting. There we go. Let's go. This is an app they built. And the idea was, quite simply, that the app would give you the coefficient of friction. So as you, whoops, stop that, exit this, oh, there we go. So they had to learn how to do coefficient of friction and, and surfaces. They turned their phone into a way to measure the coefficient of friction down these ramps. Each ramp was made out of a different material or you could put your phone onto a different material and slide it down and get and learn the coefficient of friction. They just built the app to do that. And th these are just high school students because we challenged them. And I didn't say, go build an app for coefficient of friction. I said, go build an app related to one of the exhibits we have where your smartphone becomes part of the exhibit. Any visitor to the Science Center can slide anything they want down the ramp. But if a visitor comes with a smartphone, they can download the AMP app from a QR code and then slide their smartphone down. It's that simple. So the third one here, which you'll have access to, was actually in the classroom. I had a student build an app for which, by the way, he's earned now several thousand dollars at one dollar a time. And that app solves projectile motion problems. It breaks down a projectile motion problem into a series of possible variables. If you put in three or four of the variables, it spits out the result. And my student asked, am I allowed to use this on the exam? Because it always gives the answer. And I said, well, the only student who's allowed to use it is the one who made the app, right? But it didn't stop a bunch of American students from buying it. Now, he did have to remain anonymous. And the reason, of course, is that it was a projectile motion app about launching things. And he was Egyptian, and his first name was Jihad. But he was uh, very concerned with creating an app that would work, and he's been able to sell it. Talk about being an entrepreneur in creating something that works for physics students. And talk about, as a teacher, being able to assess whether he's learned about projectile motion. The kid can now solve any projectile motion problem. 
Well, I have no doubts that he understands projectile motion. So that's a very easy way to move forward with that kind of thing. So why don't teachers do this in the classroom more frequently? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, they're afraid of the technology. This is a challenge we face, especially with elementary teachers, and not just with technology. In general, at SciWorks, we talk often about preparing kids for the STEM pipeline. You know, get them ready to do science, technology, engineering, and math, because that's where the careers are going to be. And isn't this great? We have to channel kids towards this, etc. Well, most elementary teachers have not done any math or science since high school. And in high school, they dropped it as early as they could. So they're afraid of it. And when they go and teach it in elementary school, you're sitting as young as grade three and grade four math. If the teacher is not confident, the kids pick up on it. And what do the kids learn? Mathematics is hard. Science is difficult, because my teacher is afraid of it. So I'm not going to go into that. I can't do that. But even in elementary school, if we provide kids with the access to the technology and show them that they can do it, if we can create these proscriptive rather than prescriptive environments, then we really create something in the classroom and kids develop confidence in, what, in the knowledge that they can build themselves as they move forward. But the second one is a huge difficulty. And that's that idea of control. I said earlier, you know, teachers want to be the center of attention. As teachers, we're taught in teacher's college. And I know this because I taught teacher's college for years in Tanzania, in East Africa, and in Canada. I prepared teachers to become science teachers. And they were all worried about control. They wanted to make sure that their students didn't misbehave. So if we have the kids sitting in rows, and sitting quietly and listening, you know, and, and my students were the best at this because they could fake being interested while they were asleep. Right? It was perfect. We turn out perfect chartered accountants. Right? Sit down, shut up, and look bored happily. And then you can be a chartered accountant, and that's what school trains you to do. We are afraid to allow our kids to run amok a little bit. Now, you have to maintain enough control that kids can learn, but you have to step back. If we go back to that example of having a Twitter feed next to your screen going, my students would put up the lyrics to songs in sequence. I never knew how they figured out how they could do it in sequence. How did they know who would hit first and somebody else did the next one? And yes, that wasn't particularly related to my physics course, but you have to give them that freedom at the same time as they're tweeting questions about physics. Because our classes, I had a class that was two hours long in AP Physics on Wednesday mornings from 10 to 12. I can't concentrate that long on one thing. Why do I expect that my 17-year-old students can? And yet that's the way we set up school. You know, we have to give those opportunities. So teachers have to lose a bit of control in the classroom have to allow for the students to have some freedom. And we have to get away from standardized tests, and especially what you're doing here in North Carolina, which is horrible, using those standardized tests to evaluate teachers. It's completely and utterly ridiculous. The standardized test does not evaluate you as a student in any reasonable way. Why not? Go back six slides. Learning is socially situated. We are learning together as a group. If I give you a standardized test you have to do individually, that you cannot turn to your neighbor and say, let's work together on this, then that test is not testing the education that we've been giving you. And then I'm going to turn around and say, because my students happen to live in a poor neighborhood and have no access to computers and don't have enough food at night, and they're, you know, and they're a working mom and a single mom isn't home when they get home, and so they do badly on the test score, and then I'm going to say that's a lousy teacher as a result? It's ridiculous. So until we can break away from that standardized test movement, we're not going to be able to create the kinds of classrooms we really need in order to prepare kids for the world it's going to be. 
So I like to argue this, though I get told all the time I shouldn't. But lazy teachers are actually great teachers because they step away and let the kids learn. If you have a teacher who spends six hours every night preparing every minute of every lesson, the students aren't learning. The other lesson to take from this is the one who's making the noise in the classroom is the one who's learning. If the teacher's always talking, it's only the teacher who's learning anything. You have to give the kids a chance to make noise and to learn. So what's SciWorks doing about this? Well, I know we can't change every classroom in North Carolina tomorrow to be like this. But SciWorks can offer opportunities for people to start behaving in this kind of way. This is an article by a, by a pair of researchers, Falk and Deerking, who, who researched the ways that Americans, especially because they work out on the West Coast, learn science. So the title of the document is The 95% Solution. I'm actually going to click through, but I'll talk about it as we go. The idea is we learn 95% of the science we know outside of the classroom. What we understand about science, we learn outside of the classroom, 95% of it. Let me give you a specific example. Years I taught physics, and my degree is genetics, but you know there aren't enough physics grads teaching physics. So you do a biology degree and you end up teaching physics anyway. Years I taught physics, yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. See, I, this is why I hate technology. Uh, years I taught physics, and the, I would ask my students, I would, I would teach them, or so I thought, Newton's laws of physics, Newton's three laws of motion. You know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. For, you know, inertia, if something's in motion, it's going to keep, you know, all this kind of thing, until an outside force is applied, and that force is proportional to mass times acceleration. I thought I was so, uh, so great as a teacher that my students could rhyme that off. And then, so this is from the American Scientist, this article that's about this. School is not where most Americans learn most of their science. So let me give you an example of that. <laughs> we teach these laws of motion. And so I say to my kids, you're in your car. And, you know, I'm teaching in Canada, so you're in your parents' car. <laughs> And your dad makes a sharp right turn. What happens to you? And the kids are all like, you're thrown to the left. And I'll say, and which of Newton's laws is that? Well, that's action, reaction. Sharp right turn, you go to the left. Of course, they're completely wrong. You are not thrown to the left. You're going forward. It's just the left-hand side of the car is now in the way of you going forward. You, you weren't pushed left. You're still going forward down that street. But that's now the left-hand side of the car. That's inertia. It's not action-reaction. Kids can learn it in a classroom and answer every mathematical problem you give them. But they experience science in the real world all the time. And what we have to get them to do is take that experience they have and learn about it and not make misconceptions about it. I, I taught in Africa at teacher's college. So these were people who'd already finished some level of college in physics. And I was preparing them to become physics teachers. And I would hold up two books at the front of the room, same dimensions, different weights, you know, a textbook and a notebook. And I would say, which one is going to hit the ground first? And they'd all say, the textbook. And you'd drop them. And of course, for those of you in physics, they would hit the ground at exactly the same time. Right? Perfect. Then I would get them to do the math. They had no problem with the math. Right? Let's calculate how long it takes for the books to drop. And the two calculations would come out exactly the same. And then I would hold the two books up again and say, which one's going to hit the ground first? And they'd all say, the heavy one's going to hit the ground first. Even though we'd done the math, even though they had witnessed the experiment beforehand, because nobody's ever taught them that what they see is important. They go with what they're learning in class, and that's the mathematics, not what they're expecting to see. We have to encourage people to experience the world and to learn science that way, and that's what SciWorks does. We give you a chance to engage with the actual science. That's the learning you're getting of coming to a place like SciWorks. And we have to make sure that every kid 
coming up through the school system has an opportunity to engage in a serious way with the kinds of exhibits we have so that they can learn that science through experience and not just as numbers on a page. So I think, whoops, I have to X this, don't I? I think that takes me to the end. So are there questions? Yes. I'm aware of your enormous contribution to the community, both in terms of education and community development and um, supporting the integration of different learning modalities. My question is, um, how do we go about addressing questions of helping, engaging, supporting the learning of people, including children, in values and character and other elements that are not taught in school? Um, well, first of all, I would argue that, that we do intentionally teach those things in school, though we're not always very good at it. Um, I think if we can design groups well and monitor how those groups work, then we, we're creating community within a classroom. And if we can model that well, then we create the values of community uh, in the children involved in that kind of work. Now, how do we do that on a larger scale? How do we do it? I, I'm not sure. I don't think I know an answer for that directly. But I do think that that I know that um, the student groups who were working for in my research who were, who were trying to design an exhibit became a community. They were uh, working on more than just that project together. And I think that was uh, important. But what we have to do is value what that group and what that community produces together. So one of our challenges, and those of you in education know this, if we assign kids a group project, it's next to impossible to assess. Either we say, hey, that was a group project. We're going to give you 80, and we're going to give 80 to every kid in the group, because that's what the group got. And then we create hard feelings, because you know, we get kids who say, well, I did all the work, and this other kid didn't do anything. And so one advantage of creating these maps as the students work together was that it allowed us to actually figure out not only the amount, the volume of contribution, but also the value of the contribution. So you'd have students who were making very few postings to Facebook, but the posts they made were all new ideas. Whereas you'd have another student who was posting every two minutes but most of their posts were like, hey, good job. You know, I saw a dog on the road this morning, that kind of thing. You know, Facebook posts. So, so it's a matter of trying to really establish. And then the other thing, and this is really anathema to most teachers, we gave every kid 100% if they could demonstrate that they went through the process. So we had to guarantee that the kids would take risks. I didn't tell my kids to make a video I didn't tell my kids to do anything. So they were always taking risks by choosing what to do. And if they went through the process, I had to guarantee them 100%. And that's something else we have to do in terms of we have to show them that we value what they do. But that's the only way I can think of that, is to create community and to value that. Yes. Well, and that's, that's and what so, I believe. And so what you're presenting today is how to build community, and I think that's the answer to the question. Yes. 
And, but that was much briefer and much more ni much nicer than what I just said. <laughs> Second question, in case anybody else doesn't have one, is: yeah. Do you believe in cause and effect? Oh, um, under normal circumstances, under physics, yes. Uh, though I think we're too uh, we're too ready to um, identify causes for effects that are in themselves complex. Um, many of you will be familiar with chaos theory. I, I think in many cases we look too quickly to specific causes when effects are very large things that have many, many, many implications and many causes. And trying to find that cause, you know, I've never taught history, I've been lucky, but if I ever had to teach history, one of the biggest problems I think in teaching history is that we explain it as if that timeline were logical. This is what caused World War I. It's not like that. The real world is messy and chaotic and complicated. And so although I believe that causes have effects, I think we're very poor at identifying them because I think generally the effect is large and complicated and has a multitude of causes. Oh gosh, yes. Or is that a thumb up? <laughs> okay. about what you were just talking about, um, and you hit right on the question or the scenario that, that I was going to talk about was um, my daughter does the School of math, uh, Science and Math Online. Right. And in that, um, you know, they're all pretty much similar intelligence as far as the group is concerned. And, and they do these webinars, but they're also assigned groups to do certain things. And that's one of the things that she was saying to me, Mom, I feel like I'm always doing all the work. And that's a perfect example of, um, you know, maybe if they did have a way to tweet or Facebook, I mean, if they did it in a, like that, they could be, uh, see who is doing what and who is working and, you know. You Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, of course, one answer for your daughter today, even if they don't do that, is to say, hey, in the real world, I'm part of, I don't know, 15 groups here in Winston-Salem. Um, sometimes one person in the group does all the work as adults, too. And, you know, we're all going to get credit or, you know, it's just, there's nothing fair about it. Right. But there's nothing necessarily implicitly fair in any of it. You know, that was one of the, uh, one of the most difficult things in teachers' college to explain to my teachers was uh, two things. One was it's not, classrooms aren't fair. There are going to be 25 kids in your class and two of them are going to require 90% of your time. And that's just even if it's not fair because in justice, those are the kids who will require the time. Uh, and you know, the other thing is, and, and you'll love this as students, to convince teachers you don't actually have to like all of your students because there's no way you ever are going to. And that's okay too, as long as you treat them all with justice. Yes. It just seems that people, especially younger people, they're losing their writing skills. They can't do basic math without a calculator on hand. They don't know how to approach somebody, keep eye contact, body language, speak properly. So how do you just use technology as an aid without students becoming too dependent on it and losing basic communication skills that are backgrounds to what we learn? Um, uh, okay, so I'm much less worried about that. Uh, that's because, uh, honestly, I, I don't want to uh, limit the way my students use technology. I want to say, you figure it out, the right way to use it. You know, I worry that as educators, we worry about things like whether my students have good cursive handwriting in elementary school, when really we know they're going to spend their whole lives typing. And that's just the way the world has gone. Um, I also worry, and, and one of the reasons I think I would make a terrible English teacher is because, you know, the point of uh, Facebook or tweeting or texting someone is communication. And if the communication is successful, 
does it matter if it's an emoticon or that I've written a complete sentence that makes sense? Now, of course, in the real world as adults, I'm going to be judged on my writing as well. But most students will figure that out as they go, but they use the correct communication for the experience that they're in. So I, I'm personally, I, I would not try to limit or limit and say to my students, you can only use this as an aid. I, don't, I would be thrilled if my students became over-dependent on the technology. I don't believe they do. I, I believe they, they use it in the best possible ways and they figure that out themselves. But, I, but that's been my experience. And I was lucky. I was working with 25 great kids. I, it might be different in different circumstances. More questions? So what I'm arguing is, of course, that you cannot teach your whole curriculum this way. And I would think uh, even pre-K. That is, I've yet to meet a three-year-old who cannot use an iPad you know, or, or a smartphone. And even if it's just to play games, they've already figured it out. So, so to give them that opportunity. And a lot of what I'm talking about here with high school, a lot of people went through in Montessori school and elementary similar educational foci and similar uh, environments. And somehow Montessori seems to end in grades three or four, and then we expect them to merge into our regular classrooms. And, and I think what we have to do is keep those kinds of systems going longer. So I don't think it's only secondary school students who can do this, or only elementary. I think we have to make sure that every student gets some experience like this during their educational career. And that's, uh, that's the role that I see SciWorks playing in the community. So, Teresa, any questions from your group? Okay, great, great. Any others? And don't ask me to make an app. <laughs> <laughs> but, so my question is that, you know, obviously it's a great idea to try and encourage and educate children to be you know, problem solvers and working groups and everything, it's great. But that's not really a new idea, if that makes sense. I mean, I think we've been trying to do that for a long time. And I, I, and I wonder if it's somewhat sort of contradicting to sort of try and educate people to be problem solving, because that's something like you want to do yourself. You want to figure it out yourself. So it's hard to teach someone self-reliance, if that makes sense. OK, the, the idea of problem solving not being new, you're, you're quite right. I mean, we've had inquiry learning now for an extended period of time. We've talked about uh, Gardner's uh, theories of multiple intelligences and how we all have different learning styles and this kind of thing. Um, I think what's new is, is marrying that to the technology. To say, like, if we're actually going to talk about this in teacher's college while we're preparing teachers, then we have to create like, so if we're going to really talk about complex groups and using that terminology, then we, as I said, we have to create feedback systems, ways for students to communicate that are different than the ones we have currently. And so it's that marrying it to technology that I think is actually different. And then I would argue that the biggest difference in informal education, where, what happens in a science center and why I'm arguing about this, is something I talked about. That is. We don't have to assess what you've learned. And so that's incredibly important. If we take away that idea of assessment, we change the kind of learning that happens. And I think that's a very new idea, that there's a different kind of learning that's happening. So, and then in terms of teaching people to be self-reliant, there are many, many people who argue that you can improve skills. So if we assume that creativity or collaboration are skills, then giving people practice in doing them make them better at using those skills into the future. He sort of answered my question. Oh, you're done? Uh, yeah, he sort of okay. answered it when you had answered his. Okay, great. Okay, good. Any other questions? Any other? Uh, how about from the uh, vice chair of uh, SciWorks? Got a young child, <laughs> uh, you know? 
So Paul, that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm not too sure if everybody heard it, but since you've taken rain over at uh, Cyworks and probably turned it, you know, to a new model or a different model, what, what would what would for those of us who raised our kids in Winston and brought them over to Cyworks, how would they see things being different than it was before? Uh, just today, you might not see that much different. Though we have one exhibit in currently that that um, exemplifies all the things that I'm talking about. So we have. Um, a, literally a build your own roller coaster. There are no instructions. There's no, and actually a lot of the professors here at, at Forsyth Tech came and visited and started playing with it. And despite the fact they were all adults, I couldn't get them away from it. And the idea is there's no instructions because they're not needed. People recognize what the exhibit is when they walk up to it. They know how to play with it and they're learning about potential and kinetic energy and everything else just by engaging with the exhibit and they're gaining it, the experience of it. So I've often talked about an exhibit that doesn't work. We still have it, but it, we have that right flyer. And the challenge with an exhibit like that is you press a button and a fan turns on, and eventually the plane takes off. And leaving aside for the moment that our explanation of the physics was incorrect, so we were talking about Bernoulli's theorem, which of course has nothing to do with flight. <laughs> leaving that aside for the moment, the other challenge is that kids, and they're our primary audience after all, push the button and walk away because it doesn't happen fast enough. When in fact, if we were really thinking about the experience, and hopefully you've all done this at some point in your lives, you put your hand out of a car window and turn it a little bit and your hand will go up from the wind. Right? That's what's causing flight. And if we can get people to put their hand into a wind instead of getting them to look at a plane, they'll understand far more about how flight works. Turn your hand a little bit this way and this way, and you'll have a far bigger impact. And so those are the kinds of exhibits that SciWorks will have over time. Of course, if you want to help us see us realize that, then my board is here. You're welcome to contribute to SciWorks, and we'll have those kinds of exhibits much faster. <laughs> uh, Paul, I don't have a question. I just have a comment, and this is, is to the board members. I, I really congratulate Mike and Patty and the other members of the board for, for finding such an excellent leader for SciWorks. I, I've listened to him speak several times, and, and I always come away learning something, and I've, I've been at this for, for over 25 years as a science educator, and you guys just couldn't have found a better person. So I just want to thank the board and thank, thank Paul for your leadership and, and helping people learn science. It's just fantastic. Well, thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm not going to throw, I'm not going to come up. I'm too old now. So given your, <laughs> and I've heard you speak and appreciate your vision, collaboration, goals. Um, and given that vision, collaboration, goals, um, other than money, what help or resources might develop in SciWorks and what might people in this room need help? Um, what we really need is for people to visit and to understand that the experience isn't only just for children. Like, you know, uh, we all probably went to science centers as kids. I've been to them all over the world. Uh, you know, as children, we understand and we're willing to learn. As adults, we go in and think, oh, this is an experience for kids. And it's not. I don't know all of the science around all the exhibits that we have. So what I need you to do even more than donate money to SciWorks is to visit and to encourage others to visit and to recognize that this is uh, not a luxury in a community. It's a necessity to have a working science center that really, that really works as part of the education system in a community. It's, it's not uh, every kid needs to have this experience and every adult needs to take advantage of it. So please come visit SciWorks. So um, if you can, if there's another question, there's Mona, yeah, Mona. Oh, you need this. What are your long-term plans for SciTech? For SciWorks. Um, let's say we're at the moment considering all of our options. We have uh, certain financial uh, challenges at the moment. Uh, and also challenges in terms of, of space. And we are you, clearly, the way I imagine a science center is very different 
from the Science Center we currently have. And so we're looking at our options to, to figure out how we can transform SciWorks into, a, uh, into the Science Center that, is, that the City of Arts and Innovation really requires. And, and so we're looking at a number of options to figure that out at the moment. I think you'll hear more soon. So, uh, Paul, uh, I don't think there's any more questions, but I do have one last trick question for you. Uh -oh. I want you to think back to McGill University. And uh, we weren't classmates, but we did the same program uh, called the, uh, the Diploma in Education at McGill. And uh, I'm wondering if you had the same faculty that I did for future. For future? Yeah. Pearl Franker. You had Frank Kerr. I did. Okay, I had Frank Kerr too. But uh, I was thinking of Norman Henchy. Oh, no. I, okay, I don't well, anyways, um, when I was at McGill uh, a long time ago, and Paul and I, when, when Susan Phelps brought Paul's resume to me, I said, oh my gosh, there's somebody that has the same diploma that I have, <laughs> and nobody in the world knows what it is except for Paul and I. Um, but it is from McGill University, and uh, Paul and I went to the same uh, teacher's college. And uh, I can tell you, you did McGill very proud today. Thank you very so much. So I, I want to congratulate that. you. And uh, Norman Henchy at that time was uh, teaching uh, future of education. And um, he made us just do any kind of mind boggling uh, concept that we could to put forward and sky was the limit. And uh, it's funny to reflect back now all that many years ago to what we were thinking back then and to see actually what has happened. And as they say, futurists can predict the future. And Paul, we're just so lucky to have you in Winston-Salem as a fellow Canadian, uh, you know, who is transferred to the States as well. Uh, I hope you have a long and prosperous career here and you really enjoy Winston-Salem. Thank you very much. And uh, we do have a nice framed diploma for you. It's on its way. It's yeah. being couriered <laughs> over as we speak. <laughs> Uh, and so I wish you'd uh, stick around. And anybody who would like to stick around and talk to Paul, you'll be here for a few minutes. Of course. Yes. And we'd like to take some shots and so forth, some pictures, not shots. But, but anyway, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this concludes um, SciTech for this semester. And I want to thank you all. I want to thank Therese and her group for coming all the way in from Surrey. I want to thank Michael Ayers for his support and Mike Myers for his support of, uh, of Paul and uh, letting him come over here from work and spread the spread the word on uh, on Cyworks. So thank you very much, everybody.